One really cool use of linear algebra in physics is in special relativity. Um, the problem we're studying here is let's suppose you are observing something. So when we say you're observing something, we mean you're measuring where it is at a specific time. So this reference frame here is going to be you. A reference frame is basically your set of axes and a clock that you are using to measure where something is at a certain time, right? So you imagine that everybody in the universe has their own set of rulers at right angles and a clock that they're going around with measuring. I mean, that's what we do inside of our heads, right? We have an idea of where things are uh, in terms of distance and in terms of direction, and we have an idea of when they're happening, now, later, much later, etc. And so what we're doing is looking at uh, something that's moving. Maybe it's a spaceship is kind of the classic example because you want things to be moving close to the speed of light. Um, and so the idea is that it's moving, it's doing something, but we're measuring ultimately its coordinates. And when we talk about coordinates in uh, special relativity, we're talking about four items. We're talking about the time, we're talking about the x component, the y component, and the z component. So you're accustomed to thinking of coordinates in terms of x, y, and z. That has not changed, right? Uh, we typically put the x horizontal, uh, we typically put the y vertical, and we typically put the z coming out of the screen. Um, but you can, in principle, orient them however you want. We're adding on to that time because time is now connected with space, we're going to see uh, when we get into the math here. And you notice we're multiplying by c here because we kind of have this idea that items in a vector should have the same units. And so when we take the meters per second in the c and multiply by the seconds in the time, the seconds cancel, and you're left with meters, that makes that the same units as x, y, and z that are there in this vector. We call this thing a four vector. Um, there's different notations for it. We're just going to stick with writing it as a, either as a row vector or a column vector, depending on the application that we are working with. <clears throat> the question that comes in is, if that's what you're observing, if you're observing C, T, X, Y, and Z, what does somebody else observe when they look at the same spaceship? So what we do is we say, okay, there's another observer here. This is your friend. Your friend has a red coordinate system, a red reference frame. Um, we're going to keep the x, y, and z aligned with each other. So you're agreeing on this way is x, this way is y, and this way is z. And you've agreed to you know, use the same type of clock. So you're measuring in seconds, etc. But the difference is that your friend is moving in relation to you. And so v here is going to be the velocity of your friend. And typically to keep the problem simple, we just put this along the x-axis. And even if it's not along the traditional x-axis, if your friend is going at an angle, uh, we typically rotate the axis so that it's pointing along the x, right? You, you, you can almost always rotate your axes in the problem so that it points along the direction that something is happening in the problem. And that just makes it mathematically simpler. The question becomes, what coordinates in space-time does your friend assign? So if, if your friend was looking at this spaceship and they measure a C, T, X, Y, and Z, are those the same? And spoiler alert, they're going to not be the same. And so that's why we put a prime on these. Prime, uh, you first see the prime symbol in calc 1 to show that it's a derivative. These aren't derivatives. The prime here just means it's different. It means it's the same type of thing, uh, but it's just a different instance of it. It's going to be a different value of it. You could also call these T1, X1, Y1, Z1, or and T2, X2, Y2, Z2. You could do it that way. Um, but we typically use the unprimed coordinates for your reference frame where you are observing things, and then the primed reference frame for somebody else doing some observing.
So what we're interested in is how these two sets of coordinates relate to each other, these two four vectors, because relativity, so when you get close to the speed of light, starts to mess with the relationship between space and time. In particular, it makes clocks start to move slower and rulers start to measure shorter. And it's really wild, and there's lots of cool examples you can do, but the generic case of how you and your friend are perceiving the universe is taken care of by what's called a Lorentz transformation. So the matrix we have over there on the right is what the Lorentz transformation looks like. It takes your original unprimed coordinates that you've measured for this thing in the black reference frame, and it's transforming it into the red primed coordinates that your friend is measuring in the red reference frame. Now there's some symbols in there we haven't introduced yet. So there's a couple things we need to introduce. The first thing we need to introduce is this beta here. Beta is just the, the velocity that we've already established, V, the velocity of your friend, in units of the speed of light. So since we're talking about things going close to the speed of light, right, we're interested in speeds like, you know, half the speed of light or, uh, excuse me, 0.5c, or 90% the speed of light, or 99.9% or .9 the speed of light. If we're already talking about fractions of the speed of light, then we might as well just divide out the c, right? So beta is the same thing as v, just without the c on it. It's how fast you're moving divided by the speed of light. So it's another way of writing velocity. It's velocity in units of the speed of light. Gamma is the other thing we need to introduce. This is the Lorentz factor. This is a measure of how relativistic the system is. You might notice that beta is showing up there. Another way to write gamma is that it's 1 over square root 1 minus beta squared. And so when you think about this Lorentz factor, you want to think about two extremes. The first extreme you want to think about is your speed being much, much less than the speed of light. Right, that you want to think about uh, your friend moving very, very slow compared to the light that is that you're using to make these observations. Well, if V is much, much less than C, then that makes beta much, much less than 1, right? Because you divide both sides by C. Over here you get a beta. Over here you get a 1. So your beta is going to be much, much less than 1. Another way of saying that is that 1 minus beta is going to basically be 1, right? Because if you've got 1 and you're subtracting off 10 to the negative 32, that's just 1, right? You would not write 0 .99999 with, with 31 nines out there. 31 nines, 32 nines, with a whole bunch of nines out there. Uh, you would just write it as 1, right? You would round it up to 1. Well, what that means is that your gamma is basically 1 divided by square root of 1, because 1 minus I mean, one, excuse me, 1 minus beta is going to be approximately equal to 1. 1 minus beta squared, definitely going to be approximately equal to 1, because if beta is much, much less than 1, beta squared is even smaller. That might even be worthy of a uh, triple less than sign. So you'll have gamma approximately equal to 1. And so gamma equal to 1 means you're at normal everyday experience. So this is, this is traditional non-relativistic. This is everyday experience when you have a gamma of approximately equal to 1. On the other hand, let's think about the other extreme. Let's suppose you had V being very close to the speed of light, right? Uh, I think the appropriate symbol for that is a less than tilde to show that it's definitely less than, uh, but we want it on the order of C. So this is like 99.999% the speed of light. Okay, let's think about what happens to beta then. Beta, uh, again, divide by C on both sides. Well, then that means I'm going to have a beta that's less than tilde 1. So beta is just shy of 1, right? It's going to be that point 0.99999. So then you think about uh, beta squared is going to be even closer to 1, right? It's going to be even more true. And so then your 1 minus beta squared, right? This thing, beta, really, really close to 1. So 1 minus beta squared is going to be ever so slightly above 0, right? It's just going to be a smidge. Well, think about what's going to happen in the denominator now. You've got gamma approximately equal to 1 divided by square root. 1 minus beta squared is really close to 0. Uh-oh, that's the thing we're not supposed to do, according to the mathematicians. This thing is going to approach infinity as you let v approach the speed of light. 
So gamma can have any value between one and infinity. There is no upper bound on it. It goes as high as you can stand it to write uh, uh, in your calculator or on your paper. So when you have a gamma of one, you're very close to a, uh, you're very close to everyday experience. When you have gamma approaching infinity, uh, you are headed into very, very relativistic strange behavior territory. And so when it comes time to do this transformation, to understand the relationship between your reference frame and your friend's reference frame, you just carry out this type of multiplication like we've seen before. You take uh, this row, multiply it by the uh, column vector that you have here, uh, meaning you multiply each piece together and then add them up, and that's going to give you your new CT prime. So your CT prime is going to be gamma times CT minus beta gamma times X, and then zeros for the Y and the Z. And then you're going to do the same thing here. You're going to take the second row, multiply it by the column here. That's going to give you X prime, the second element uh, in the new vector. So you're going to have an X prime equal to negative beta gamma CT, a lot of, uh, a lot of letters going on there, uh, plus gamma times X, and then zeros for the x, uh, zeros for the y and the z terms. The cool thing about this is because you've only got zero, you've only got ones on the uh, on the diagonal here for y and z. It just means that your y prime is going to be y and your z prime is going to be z. In other words, traveling your friend traveling along the x-axis leaves their y and z observations unchanged. It leaves those the same. Relativity only affects the direction that you are traveling in. But if we change that, if we say we're going along the Y, then we have to start moving around these betas and gammas inside the matrix there. Now, the problem that I want us to explore is what happens when there's another observer? What happens when you have other friend coming by who is now moving at a speed, uh, I guess we need to call, maybe we'll call it U, uh, just so we don't need to worry about uh, writing V1 and V2. Uh, what are they going to observe compared to yours and compared to your friends. That's going to require multiple matrices. We're going to have to multiply uh, entire matrices together. And so that's what we'll take a look at on the next video.